for the ping, haven't we? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where are we? Let's get my slides going. Right, well, thank you everyone for coming along tonight. And I say tonight, I'm presuming most of you in the UK, but if you're all over the world, it could be tonight, morning, afternoon. Um, I'm going to do a wee presentation this afternoon, uh, this evening, about uh, the history of kilts and tartan, um, which is, apart from Formula One, is my other um, passion in life. Um, obviously, with my accent, you've probably gathered that I live in Scotland and I also work in Scotland. Um, but I'm also, as well as my teaching job, I'm also actually a kilt maker as well. So I was part of Via 21. Um, I live in the central belt of Scotland. If you're not very familiar with Scotland, it's kind of, we've got Edinburgh on one side and Glasgow on the other. And we've kind of got Stirling sort of in the middle and I'm close to Stirling. So we're kind of handy for everywhere. So we're right deep in the thick of it. Um, this picture in the background here is quite a famous part of Scotland, which is the Kelpie statues. That's actually um, just down the road from where I live. And that's kind of my daughter just plays football just to the side of it. Um, I've been a home economics teacher for quite a while. Um, also the PT of digital at my school, which is quite a small school, um, which is how they've managed to persuade me to take on a digital role, despite the fact I've also got a full home economics timetable, but that's life. Um, I've been a stitcher or a sewer all my life. I've always enjoyed it as a hobby. And I think it was about 2016, I decided that I really should actually do something productive with it. Um, my daughter had just started doing Highland dancing at that point, which if anyone knows anything about it, it's probably the most ridiculously expensive kind of dancing for any child to get into. So I figured it would be a good idea of putting my sewing abilities to good use. And I actually went and did a training a course which went on for several months training to be a kilt maker so the kind of kilt making that I do is all very much about um, the traditional handmade kilts and we'll talk about the difference between handmade kilts and the kind of the rubbishy machine made ones um, later on okay so I'm gonna give you I mean it really is a kind of potty history of tartan and the kind of history and the culture behind it um, and I'm also gonna cover a little bit about the kilt and how it was created. Um, I know there's a few people who are big fans of Outlander, so I'll explain a little bit about the costume that's involved in there. And I've also got some photographs of the kinds of tartans and kilts that I've made. Um, and I'll give you a link as well, where you can design your own tartan at the end if you're feeling a bit creative. So tartan itself, the actual fabric, is basically a checked cloth. But in order for it to be recognised as a tartan, there's a few different rules. First of all, it has to have at least two different colours in it. Um, and you can see from this little video I put in there, I'll just press play again because it's really short. Um, you can see in this wee video, there is a pattern that goes across the way and a pattern that goes up and down the way. Now, these threads that go lengthwise are called the warp threads and the threads that go across it are called the weft threads. Now, the pattern of this tartan that's being woven on this loom is would start just at the white one and go up to the next white. And then that pattern is repeated again. But what makes it a tartan is because it's also repeated in the weft going up and down the way across the warp. And that's why your patterns are completely square. So that's what makes it a tartan. It also has to be um, the sequence, the the combination of those yarns, that pattern, they actually create that into a code. Now, the code is named after a family or possibly an estate or even a clan. And we don't call it a sequence, we call it a set. So if you were going to a uh, weavers to have a tartan woven for you, you would ask for the Bell set or the um, Lamont set. You know, that's what they would be looking for. So that's the name of it. The set is the sequence of the colours. And it's actually, read, by the time the weavers get it, it's actually quite a straightforward um, list of numbers and letters. It's just like a, a number, a letter for the colour and then the amount of threads. So it might be, if there's two yellow threads, it'd be Y2. And that just goes on and then it repeats itself. So that's how the weavers know to get it almost identical. Every set, every recognised tartan or every tartan has to be registered before it's officially a tartan. So if you are having a 
a tartan design. I'll show you one I did in a wee minute. You have to get it approved by the Scottish Tartans Authority and the Scottish Tartan Registry. And it sounds almost it sounds almost jokey. A lot of people don't appreciate just how serious we take it in this country. And if you put a tartan in that's too similar to another one, it will get thrown right back and you have to redesign it. It has to go through a lot of approval before you're allowed to get it registered. So this one here is just, this is just a screenshot of a web page. Um, this is from the Scottish Register of Tartans. Now, a few years ago, I did a tartan for Grangemouth Rugby Club and I designed it. It was, the players had some contribution as well and it was based on the, the colours of the club. And if you can see here, you know, we've got a repeat. It's pretty straightforward. I've got some of it lying around. I can show you in a wee bit. Um, but you have to, put certain notes on it and you have to see if it's a restricted tartan or non-restricted. So restricted basically means that it's only for people within a certain organisation. And this one, as you can see, is just for the players, the members and the supporters of Grangemouth Rugby Club. Once you get it registered, I think you have to pay about £100 for the actual registration process. You then have to get it woven. You have to guarantee that you're going to get this tartan woven because there's a lot of people that design a wee tartan, they get it registered and that's the end of it. You know, they never do anything with it. And once you've had it woven, you send a sample of it to the Register of Tartans, which is in the National Library of Scotland, and they will keep it in a booklet and it will be there for years to come for people to look at it. So looking at the history of tartan as a fabric, well, it's often associated with types of rebellion. The actual history history of tartan is, it goes on for thousands of years. We know that the Celts were weaving tartan over 3000 years ago. And um, there's traces of tartan style fabrics in China and all over the world. But the actual tartan that we, what we recognize as tartan and the Scottish kind of cultural tartan really is, became most famous with the Jacobites. And they wore it essentially as their uniform when they were having their, their uprisings and rebellions. Um, the Jacobite uprisings, and they had their ultimate failure, the famous Battle of Culloden um, on the 16th of April in 1746. Now, after that, the government, the British Parliament, decided that they were going to try and crush that Highland culture. And essentially, they banned the wearing of, of tartan, Highland dress, but it was, it was tartan. Um, there's a bit of a misconception around that, though, because it actually only applied to men and boys. But because of the way things were, the kind of suspicion that was happening in those days, um, anyone that was really kind of caught wearing bits of tartan was kind of potentially would get into trouble. Um, there's some records. I remember reading something about um the government, I think it was just the year after the Battle of Culloden, and the government ordered that women that were wearing tartan ribbon on their dress, they were wearing little tartan ribbons, were to be arrested because they were worried that they would be celebrating the, the birthday of Bonnie Prince Charlie. There was also stories as well of people who were having family portraits done after that. There was, I think it was Lady Macdonald of Sleet, I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was her. Um, she had a painting of her two sons done and she had them in Highland dress. And the painter refused to put his name to the portrait because he was breaking the law by, by painting these boys in tartan. And she was breaking the law because she had her sons dressed in tartan. So, yeah, you can imagine there was there was a lot of worries about it. I think that the actual penalty for it was six months in prison. And if you did it a second time, or you were caught a second time, you get sent off to the colonies. One of the stories I particularly like about tartan is to do with the Black Watch tartan. Now, people are familiar with the Black Watch. Um, it's what, if you're not, it's a, a Scottish army regiment. Um, it's not allowed in, it's not in, in force anymore, unfortunately. Uh, but their tartan that they have here, you can see on these kilts, it's a really, really popular one. Now, for me, the irony of this is that the Black Watch was actually created in 1715 after the first Jacobite uprisings. And they were created to stop the Jacobites. And when it came into the, when the law of the Highland Dress Act came into being, they were the ones who were going around, burning down the mills, burning down houses, taking the traces of tartan out of people's homes and, and destroying it. So the tartan that we seem to enjoy so much these days, it's actually got quite a, a, a bad history from, from our perspective. 
Um, Flora MacDonald, who was famous for carrying Bonnie Prince Charlie over the sea to sky. She had, well, she was put into the Tower of London for this, but afterwards she came out and she was kind of celebrated as a hero and they painted her with this beautiful tartan plaid over her shoulders. So in 1782, the ban was overturned and tartan kind of gained favour, but there was nothing particularly trendy about it. It wasn't massively fashionable. And then in 1822, George IV came to Scotland. Um, he was invited by Sir Walter Scott, who had this novel, The Waverly, Waverly, which was this kind of big romantic idea of what Highland life was, a bit similar to Outlander, to be honest. Um, and George IV came and he decided he was going to wear full Highland dress. There's some paintings of it of the time. And it's almost comical, actually, when you look back at it now. So he basically was wearing all this garb and then everybody wanted to wear tartan. So everyone in the UK was wearing tartan because of this. All the nobles and the wealthy people also wanted to be a part of it. They were buying into this kind of romantic Highlands culture. So they were going to the mills. The mills had already clocked this trend and they produced these catalogues of different tartan patterns. So you'd have people like Mackenzie's going down, it's like, we'll have that one. And that became the Mackenzie tartan. And the, um, I'm trying to think of the others, or oh, the Carnegie's, they went down, yep, we'll have that one. So they had the Carnegie tartan. So this idea that these tartans are clan tartans going back centuries, to be honest, it's a bit of a myth. Most tartans, because we don't know what the old tartans were because the Black Watch were so good at destroying them, that most tartans that we recognize today, which are associated with clans, are from 1822 and onwards. English punks made tartan very popular, um, and a lot of that was because of designers uh, Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood. And Vivian Westwood, we know, is the mother of punk. Um, she has some amazing designs. I've just put a couple of her pieces um, in here. So this lovely big one at the side here being modelled by Naomi Campbell. Again, she's using tartan, big swathes of it. And we've also got this one here, this kind of hunting outfit. I love working with tartan because of the lines on it. I mean, it's not just about making the kilts. You can see this one that we've got here. It's all what we call cut on the bias. And you can see the way that it, the diagonals form and it shapes the body. It's a beautiful fabric to work with. Um, we've got this one down here, the Burberry check being worn by Beyonce. Burberry tart is actually a tartan or we call it the Burberry check, but it's a Burberry tartan. And it's again, really famous. So obviously with COP26 just up the road for me at the moment, um, I thought I'd mention a little bit about sustainability. Now proper tartan is made from pure wool. It's one of the most sustainable fabrics on the planet. In fact, it's carbon neutral. So that's another reason why I love working with it. There's a lot of myths about wool being scratchy, but you can the way that wool can be processed these days, you know, you would be surprised. You, you could possibly pick up garments and, and you wouldn't realize that they were even wool. But I love working with it. Most kilts, when they're made, they actually don't ever get disposed of. They don't um, tend to get put into, buried into the ground or go into waste. They generally get used over and over again. So looking at the actual history of the kilt itself, um, if you're an Outlander fan, you'll be familiar with this. This is called the Philomore, and this is known as the Belted Plaid. Now, it was a big piece of fabric, essentially. And it was, they say it was about five meters long. You'll get different stories on it. And it was just a big, long piece of cloth. Now, what they did was they would gather it up at the back and bring it around them at the front, put a big leather belt round, which held it over. And then they had this longer piece hanging down. And it was that longer piece that was then picked up and put over the shoulder. Now, this was a fantastic thing because they had a blanket when they were getting cold. They had a hood if it was raining. Um, the Highlanders would be out in, in the wild and they would actually sleep in it. There's stories that Highlanders would dip it into water first. And if you know much about wool, you know that it soaks up water. And on a really cold night, they'd let it soak up the water and then they'd let it freeze over themselves. So they would kind of create a tent and let it freeze. And that layer of ice and their cells being inside it, it was quite a layer of insulation and it would keep them warm. I'm not planning on trying that. I don't believe a word of it. Um, if you've watched the 
episodes of um, Outlander, you'll know that there's a, a, a part where he's lying on the floor and it's stretched right across the room and it shows you meticulously putting the folds in it and then lying on top of it and wrapping it around himself. That's kind of what they expect you, the, the kind of myth that's been perpetuated. But if you think about it practically, most people, you wouldn't manage that in a house of today's sizes. So the idea that people living in these little stone cottages back in those days would have enough room on their floor to even do it. I mean, you couldn't do it in a field. The weather would be atrocious. It would be blown halfway down the road. So there's no way that was happening. They actually reckon now, the clothes historians reckon that they had little loops inside. So they already had the gathers and the pleats already kind of held in place. Um, something that's quite interesting, the word plaid is actually a Gallic term for blanket. And although it did provide shelter and warmth, it was also a fantastic way of concealing weapons. The way that they would create the pouches at the side, it was basically the first types of pockets. And they would very cleverly have little daggers and things and stuff in there. So the modern kilt, which is probably what you're more used to seeing, and these are the ones that I make. So its name is the little kilt or the fill a bag. And it kind of first became popular about 300 years ago. Nobody's totally sure what the actual date for this one was. And it's believed that it was the manager of an ironworks who had the traditional big kilt, the, modern, the large plaid, and he got soaked out in the, way, in the rain, which isn't a surprise really. And the weight of it when it soaked up all the rain, but he still wanted to wear a kilt. So he literally cut the top part off in frustration and then he decided he quite likes it. So he took, got a tailor to sew the pleats in permanently into the bottom half. So that evolved into what we know as our, our modern kilt. And it's actually a length of a solid strip of eight yards of woolen cloth. And it is separated, it's not separated physically, it's just the way that it's folded differently. So the first part is called the front apron, which stays flat, but has a decorative selvage. And then we have the pleating and the pleat can be done either to the stripe or to the set. Now this picture up in the top here, this chap with this kind of blue and red one, this one is done to the stripe. But you can see here, these two are pleated so it looks like the set of the tartan. So that's the difference, the pleated to the stripe or pleated to the set. Personally, I like pleating to the stripe. I think it's much more dramatic. You get better movement out the kilt when it's dancing. Um, it was adopted by the military and modern Scots because it was a lot more wearable. And so it wasn't just the Highlanders that were wearing it. It really kind of went down through the whole country. And the proper way to wear it is to wear it with something called a sporran, which is this the, the one in here of all these pipers. This is a very elaborate sporran. You wouldn't find most people wearing that. It's usually a much kind of smaller leather pouch. And um, you've got your hose, which should come up to just below the knee. In the, knee, in the hose, you should have your flashies, which are either matching tartan of the kilt or a colour which is picked out of the, color of, of the kilt. And you can just see in this wee one here, it's something called a ski and do. Now, your ski and do is actually a small dagger. We don't tend to arm them too much. Um, <laughs> most of them are made of plastic these days. So I'm just watching my time. I better get moving. So I've just got a few photographs as well. I'll show you in here. This is, I thought was a really good photo of kilts being worn in battle. So this is me sewing a kilt. This is a video here. It takes me about between 16 to 20 hours to do a kilt from scratch. Um, the pleating is invisible. Sorry, the stitching is invisible in the pleats. You can just see there how the thread sinks into that. Um, we do a hand sewn kilt, it's got a curve in it. It's actually shaped to fit the body. You would never get that in a machine kilt, which is why they're so expensive. I mean, the price does look quite a lot of money, but to be honest with you, the fabric alone usually costs up to 200 pounds. So, and that's at trade prices. So we do, don't necessarily make a huge amount of money out of it. Um, I'm just gonna move along. So these are just some kilts that I've made. Um, this one here, this is a father and son I did for a wedding, which was um, in Harris. Um, this is, again, this is an outfit I made for somebody. This is her dancing in Tartan Week. This is a link here. Um, you'll get the slides when we share them out. And it's a Tartan design program that you can use if you fancy designing your own Tartan. A um, couple of questions before I finish, because I don't want to overrun. Can anyone wear a kilt? 
absolutely. We love seeing people in kilts in Scotland. We absolutely love it. Tourists, we don't care. Come on, enjoy our culture, okay? Um, can you only wear your family tartan? No, you can wear any tartan you like. About hiring kilt, well, there's a really um, disgusting explanation of that. I'll maybe spare you that one. But the last thing I want to show you is what does a true Scotsman wear under his kilt? If you're of a sensitive disposition, look away now. <laughs> Sorry, I had to get that photo in somehow, that beautifully placed scarf. <laughs> All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that. Stunned into silence.